watch the Recently. classic. Good to know. Sorry. Uh, those of you that rewatched the movie recently know that the movie ends with a bunch of atomic bombs going off and the original Vera Lynn version of We Meet Again. Uh, I like to give my students an alternative version of a big Johnny Cash song and I tell them my karaoke game is very limited. I can do You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch and a handful of songs recorded by Johnny Cash. But if it's not that, it's not in my register and I cannot do it in, in karaoke. Uh, so I am teaching this new course this semester, a history of war and film. It's a transnational history course, so it's not all American films. Over the course of 14 weeks, we watch about 17 feature length movies. We watch them in the chronological order in which they were released. About half of them are American and the other half come from other nations, uh, mostly European. OK, so there's a, a couple of Soviet movies, uh, several English movies, a couple of French movies and so forth. But obviously, the genre of the war movie has been dominated by Hollywood since, since, it's, uh, excuse me, since its inception. And as a consequence, uh, it's hard to ignore many of the great American war movies that have been made. This is the only overtly comedic movie that we show uh, in the course of the semester. And thus far, early indications are it is among the most popular movies that I have introduced the undergraduates to. But I didn't actually have seen this movie already, which tells you something about the staying power of this movie. And you have to under appreciate moreover, for the undergraduates, they are inundated with media choices, with all of the streaming channels and different movies and everything else. So we get into other things. You know, how many of you have seen Bridge on the River Kwai? You know, a smattering of hands. And I've got 90 people in the auditorium, right? So it's a pretty good uh, sample size. And most of what we would regard as classic war movies, they haven't seen. But apparently they do have an eye or an ear for satire because most of them have seen this. And most of them remain pretty well versed in Monty Python uh, as well. So the, the structure of the course that I teach is uh, usually in a typical week, we'll watch one movie and there's going to be one lecture on the real history and the other movie, the lecture is on the real history, you know, the two spellings of the word, okay? The history of the movie as a cultural artifact from the era in which it was made. What can we learn about, in this instance, 1964 America, the context of the Cold War, and the other one focused on the actual history behind the events depicted in the film. This movie is unique in the course offerings, not merely because it's the only overt comedy, it's the only satire we're watching, but it's also the only one that is not a historical movie at the time it's released, right? To us watching it today, it's a historical artifact, but it's set in the present day of 1964 when the movie comes out, which makes it different from many of the other movies that we watch. Here on this screen, you can see a number of images. It's a mosaic that gives you a sense of the cultural milieu in 1964 when Dr. Strangelove was released. And Many of you in the room have, no doubt, living and vivid memories of this particular era. A uh, senior auditor once gave me, after you know, a, a version of this lecture that had nothing to do with Dr. Strangelove, a, a cartoon uh, captioned Cold War Reenactors, and it was a bunch of old people huddled underneath their, their, their desks uh, like that. But, uh, you know, it's kind of easy to laugh at now. And I you know, sometimes show undergraduates the famous duck and cover film, you know, which is it puts kind of a whimsical spin on this. But there's not much whimsy at the time. Right. So some of the events that are depicted here, the detonation of the first Soviet nuclear device in the fall of 1949, the launching of Sputnik 1 late in the Eisenhower administration, which really was a terrifying event for everyone in the West because you, you, one plus two, right? If you have nuclear warheads and now you can put them into outer space, that means you can put them in the continental United States as well, gives rise to the bomb shelters, these school drills. And then of course, the most immediate uh, a kind of historical event that, that uh, 
led to a spasm or a paroxysm of fear in the body politic was the Cuban Missile Crisis, just a couple of years before Dr. Strangelove was released. And all of this, of course, bears upon Stanley Kubrick and his desire to make this movie. Uh, the th most recent event, though, that influenced him was the Berlin Crisis, which unfolded while he was making his previous motion picture, Lolita. And he determined, while he was still making Lolita, that he had to make a movie about the existential crisis that was then confronting humankind. And his original intent was to do a very serious movie. And he wanted to do it quickly, right? This is a of the moment kind of topic. And he went looking for source material and he found it. And he found it in Peter George, who served in the Royal Air Force in World War II uh, and afterward retiring from the RAF in 1961. Uh, he was also a part-time author. He wrote while in uniform under the pseudonym Peter Brandt. Most of his oeuvre was pulp fiction, okay? I mean, most of it is, I've not read it, but I don't think I'll offend his estate by calling it forgettable. His one unforgettable work, however, was a 1958 book based upon inside knowledge as an officer in the RAF, and that is Two Hours to Doom. Kubrick paid him not the tidy sum, but the tiny sum of only $3,500 to option that novel for a motion picture. But he also gave uh, uh, Peter George the job of being co-screenwriter. So he bought the rights to the novel from him and then brought him in and he would be allowed to co-write the screenplay for the movie that Kubrick wanted to make. Uh, Unfortunately for them, these would-be filmmakers of what would become Dr. Strangelove, a very similar, very similar story came out during the Cuban Missile Crisis. This novel was titled Failsafe, and its authors had you know, great credentials as the author of, you know, for this kind of work. Eugene Burdick was a World War II Navy officer and a political science professor at Cal. Harvey Wheeler was also a political science professor, had been taught at Harvard Hopkins, and then finally at Washington and Lee University. Now, Kubrick and George were none too happy about the publication of this novel. It eventually led to cheeky reprints of George's Two Dollars to Doom under an American title, Red Alert. And if you read it, the cover of this paperback, Heard of Failsafe, you know, that novel that ripped me off. Here's the original version of the novel republished for American audiences. Uh, the bigger problem was not that the novel failsafe was going to steal any thunder away from Kubrick's plans. It is that that novel itself had been optioned for a motion picture by the filmmaker Sidney Lumet. This, the movie version failsafe, prompted a lawsuit by Peter George, urged on by Kubrick, uh, which was ultimately settled out of court. And in an odd sort of twist with this, Columbia Pictures obtained the rights to both movies, right? So they sort of bought out the, co the, uh, the competition, sort of, a, sort of a capture and kill, except in this case, it was a capture and deferred release. Okay, so there was a cash settlement, but on top of that, it meant in the calendar year 1964, Dr. Strangelove would come out at the very beginning of the year, and Failsafe wouldn't come out until the autumn. It was critically acclaimed. Anybody in here seen? I, I'm afraid I, we've got quite a few participants on Zoom, and I won't be able to see the raised hands. Maybe Bree can tell me. Anybody actually seen Failsafe? Okay, so in the room, we have one, I had never seen it before I decided to offer this course and had to educate myself on it, right? Because it's sort of part of the filmography that's relevant to Dr. Strangelove. And yeah, I mean, the thumbs down, uh, I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it some credit. It, it was critically acclaimed. I'm gonna show you some clips from Failsafe so you can kind of get a sense of the tone of this movie vis-a-vis -vis Dr. Uh, Strangelove. But 
it's really hard to follow in the footsteps of what became an instant classic. The basic storylines of the book are not surprisingly very similar, given that one was plagiarized off of the earlier novel. Uh, one critical difference in Failsafe, um, it's not a mad general, Jack D. Ripper, who is behind you know, a plot that's going to lead, lead to doomsday. Rather, it's a technical glitch. That's one difference. Uh, and the end of the movie in Failsafe has an interesting plot twist, I, I think, or a moral conundrum which I will not spoil for any of you since only one of you has seen it. So it may be, may be worth watching uh, just for that. Otherwise, Kubrick and uh, Lumet's movies might have been almost indistinguishable had Kubrick stuck with his original plan and released Dr. Strangelove as a straight drama thriller under the title The Delicate Balance of Terror. Uh, certainly did his homework to produce such a movie. In the wake of the first dropping of atomic bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we saw the emergence in the defense sector of a new breed of defense policy maker. I'm talking here about the rise of the defense intellectual, uh, typified perhaps most famously by Bernard Brody, pictured here lecturing a bunch of senior NATO officers on you know, some arcane topic about nuclear war. But it's at this moment, right, that we see a veritable explosion of what Eisenhower would later call the military industrial complex with all of these civilian defense intellectuals because the business of war has now become way too serious and way too omnipresent and, and way too much of a, a going concern on which people can make careers and money to just leave to the generals and sort of a small staff of, of folks inside Washington, D.C. So you get a lot of the political scientists that, that start to make careers as theorists on the topic of nuclear warfare. Some are better than others. Uh, many of them are, in fact, brilliant. And Kubrick, as I said, did his homework. He read all of their works. He read Brody. He wrote, uh, read uh, Schelling and Herman Kahn. And in fact, he consulted directly with Schelling and with Herman Kahn. Um, Kahn was especially influential uh, in the making of this movie. Uh, and, and moreover, influential in the books, right, upon which the movie was based, or the, the, the two books uh, derived from Peter George's work, insofar as they give readers or viewers a sense of these theorists, these nuclear strategists who believe in such a thing as game theory and an escalation ladder that might be used in the event of nuclear war, right? The kind of two prevailing paradigms for thinking about this. One of them, and this is what Eisenhower really thought, is you go to war with the Soviets, it's going to go, to use a, a term of speech in the military, high into the left almost immediately. There's no restraining it. It's going to escalate, and it's naturally going to culminate in, in some kind of spasm attack by, by either side, and you're going to see the end of the world. People like Herman Kahn, on the other hand, argued that you could instead continue to communicate with the enemy and move through rungs on an escalation ladder and cool it back down as though there was sort of a rheostat you could control with air power and intercontinental ballistic missiles, and that you could, in fact, wage thermonuclear war and win it, and you could do so without ending the world. Herman Kahn was therefore supposedly the inspiration for Dr. Strangelove himself and his counterpart in the movie Failsafe, Dr. Grotschely. And I'm going to now show you a clip from uh, uh, Failsafe, and you can get a sense of a, a caricature of what one of these nuclear defense intellectuals was like. I don't think Bill Kelly's going to discuss that today. Can you hear back there? I got your bell. Why well, are you open a can of peas? Right, he's got one of them in his dark. This whole policy of overkill, it makes no sense by not bones. We already have shown the cave. Not today. 
Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Oh, won't you sit over there? I hate to ruin anything for you, but having worked in the Pentagon for three years, this is more like war rooms in the Pentagon than the war room at Doctor Strange. There's no, there's nothing like the war room. In the I see we have an alert to supplement our discussion. Unfortunately, we settled a question of accidental law last week, so we can't make good for today. <laughs> today, the subject is limited for. It is not theoretical. Well, it depends the kind of weapons we use, where we locate them, how we short our entire military function. So, it is limited war possible. Can we confine the exchange of nuclear weapons to military targets alone, almost war leading evidence with the construction of cities? Why? The object of war is to inflict maximum damage on the enemy, destroy his ability to resist. In the last war, both sides could have used bacterial warfare. They didn't. It wouldn't have been decisive. Can you be sure? Well, maybe people still couldn't get used to the idea of killing civilians. Suggest you take that up with the civilians of London, London, Best, Tokyo, killed by thousands of bombs. I omit Hiroshima and Nagasaki since those actions bore more probably in World War III than World War II. I still don't see how we could restrict the war. We could come to a mutual agreement with the Russians, uh, strike only missile bases. But if the missile bases were near the cities, they would have an incentive to move them elsewhere. If they can offer it, the sign of peace on our part. Good and good and good. Not as much as good as we have. We're talking about the wrong subject. So the stuff war, a little bit. So that, uh, not up to us, General Black. We're the ones who know most about it. We are so you black. We carry out our We won't make it. From Tidges out there. The way we say a war can be fought is made for us. If we say we can find a limit of war with nuclear weapons, all we do is let everyone off the hook. We probably won't do it we can just keep on doing what we're doing and nobody even gets serious. But you can fight a limited war, you know it. Why, Bob? I'm not so sure. There's no such thing as a limited war. Not with hydrogen bombs in it. And those bombs said we thought we won't be able to limit our damage. Are you uh, advocating the song of Daryl Boy? I don't uh, it's the logic of your position. Peculiar reversal of press would be interesting. The military man who is the dub and the civilian is <laughs> So, what's interesting about this scene is it really accurately captures you know, the, the essence of this kind of theoretical debate over whether or not limited nuclear war is, in fact, possible. And as I said, Herman Kahn is the actual real life inspiration, both for the fictitious Dr. Uh, Grotischilla here, as well as for our mad scientist for the motion picture you watch for today, Dr. Strangelove as well. In this regard, I can't help but think of the, these two movies, Failsafe and Dr. Strangelove, as being somewhat similar to the Daryl Zanuck 1962 movie, The Longest Day, and Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan, right? The Longest Day is intent upon being a history lesson, right? It's sort of over the top. They're lecturing you, the viewer. This is all of the planning stuff that went on behind the scenes. You, know, you, you actually can learn something about the planning for D-Day from watching the longest day, but you really don't get any sense of what it was actually like on the beaches, where Saving Private Ryan is the other way around. You don't learn any, there's no history lesson there. You get a really visceral, pounding sense of what that experience of combat might have been like. This is similar but different, right? Where Lumet seems intent upon lecturing the audience to understand, you know, these are kind of the crackpot scientists who are actually out there, and this is the way they really think. 
particularly at the the Rand Corporation, which is euphemized in in Doctor Strangelove as the Bland Corporation, uh, which is <laughs> the dumbest acronym ever devised. Rand stands for Research and Development. That's the that's what the acronym Rand means, and it's an Air Force think tank to develop ideas that are conducive to the prerogatives of the U.S. Air Force. And if you want to read a, a very good book, kind of journalistic more than historical, on the subject and about these theorists for limited nuclear war, the title of the book is Wizards of Armageddon by Kaplan, uh, and it gives you a good sense of sort of this, this mindset uh, uh, typified by each of these characters. Now, Clearly, now that we've introduced our protagonist, uh, Dr. Strangelove here, Kubrick did not stick with his original plan of doing a straight drama thriller on the dangers of nuclear war. Instead, he had an epiphany that he would do this as a black comedy. So he brought in a third screenwriter, Terry Southern, but these are the three screenwriters, but there should be no mistake about this. This movie was all Stanley Kubrick. He was writer, director, producer. This was part of a new wave in the 1950s following the breakdown of some of, sort of the, the super hegemonic control of the studio system in which auteur directors like Kubrick had broad license to do what they wanted with these films, but they were still playing with other people's money. But you can kind of get some sense of this auteur moment with the whole Lenny Bruce beatneck shtick of the screenwriters here, the skinny black ties, cigarettes, uh, uh, sun, sunken eyes that go along with the lifestyle of being an auteur in, in the, the late 50s. So we did not shoot it straight. Or, or rather Stanley Kubrick did, decided not to shoot it straight and take this comedic turn instead. So let's contrast the tone of the two movies in addressing an identical question. Remember, both movies are ultimately based upon the same source material. And so the characters at some point in each of the movies have to confront this nerve wracking question. Will the bombers get through? You know, not, notwithstanding the fact that we're actually helping the Soviets now trying to shoot down our own bombers, will some of them, in fact, leak through? So let's watch each movie as they explore this question. We'll begin with Failsafe, and then we'll go to Dr. Strangelove. I Those were U.S. fighters chasing U.S. bombers to shoot them down, and you just got the report. We so we, we, we couldn't shoot them down. Heading to the Moscow. Calculations are under times. What they have in their defenses, what our fans are capable of. The indicators rise so fast, the Russian people, all the defense calculations. One or two of the bombs would get through. Thank you. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed that we can and remember that this one thing we are all in this together. We're right behind you, and we will be all over. Yes, well, we'll keep the line open. All right, thank you. Thank you. The rusty trucks, the Frank and Ethan shot at no You just can't expect a bunch of ignorant idiots to understand what she makes them hard. There's not many things. You can take your average rusty, we all know how much stuff. We can all live in that and build all these buildings. Just think of the point, General. Well, I'm 
I don't know how many times I've seen this movie, but it, I, it, I laugh out loud every time I, I watch that 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 sequence. In retrospect, I mean, it's so easy to appreciate the brilliance of Kubrick's decision to do this as a black comedy, as well as the the, the, the casting in this movie, George C. Scott, and of course Peter Sellers playing th three different roles in the movie. But remember. Kubrick's got wide authority at this moment in, in Hollywood history, but he's still playing with other people's money. And this approach has other people, too, very, very nervous. So in retrospect, we can see that the, this was a brilliant decision, but that confidence wasn't there on the, the front end of this. And this extended to even the advertising campaign for the movie. Even this is all Kubrick, right? So Kubrick has artistic control over the advertising campaign for the movie. And this made the studio nervous as well. And aesthetically, I think you can appreciate that this artwork and the way that they're selling the movie prefigures the counterculture of the 1960s. These are 1960s movie posters. These are not 1950s movie posters. I mean, I know that sounds obvious, right? The movie's released in 1964, but you're still kind of at a crossroads at this time in terms of the aesthetic and in terms of the audience that you are trying to reach. Um, and this is also, I would argue, at a crossroads in what is animating American fears about the nuclear age. In the late 50s, the prevalent fears were about what the Soviets could do to us, especially after the launching of, of Sputnik. And were we ready for that? Remember that Kennedy got elected, at least in part, by fear mongering around a fictitious uh, missile gap, right? Kind of unexpected, especially for many of the undergraduates learning that the, the Democrat Kennedy running against the Republican Nixon with a stronger on defense plank to his, his platform. You know, we're going to restore strength and respect to the American military, not like that, you know, Eisenhower Nixon administration, which allowed it to atrophy. We're going to make it strong again. And voters rewarded the Kennedy Johnson ticket for that because of the prevalent fear in the late 50s about what the Soviets could do to us. But then in the wake of the Berlin crisis and more poignantly, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the fear mounts about, my God, what, what can we do to ourselves? What will happen in the future if a president actually listens to a Curtis LeMay? Now, in the first chapter of this, though, when people are paralyzed by fear about what the Soviets can do to us, the United States, along with its allies, construct deliberately a system of hair triggers to make sure that the Soviets do not get the drop on the United States or any of its allies. Especially after the launching of Sputnik, there is a great fear of a decapitation attack. And the fear of a de decapitation attack mounts, right, as the Soviets actually field a reliable ICBM force and develops their own submarine launch ballistic missiles. And so this fear continues to, to mount over time. But the fear essentially is that the, the Soviets could steal some kind of sneak attack and knock out Washington, D.C., paralyzing the United States and leaving it in some kind of position where all it can do is, is accept abject defeat or suffer total annihilation without firing a shot in return. In response to that fear, uh, the government kicked off a very ambitious project with so many dimensions. I can address some of those during the question and answer a portion of this talk if you, you like. But I'd like to focus on you know some of them that are prevalent in each of the movies that I've been talking about, Fail Safe and Dr. Strangelove. And that is having a nuclear ready force always on standby. Operation Chrome Dome from 1960 until 1968, having B-52s with nuclear weapons in their payloads flying in the air at all times and kind of racetrack patterns. So if there is an alarm, you don't have to worry about scrambling them. They're already above the Arctic Circle 
and ready to go bomb the Soviet Union. Looking Glass, which was the airborne command post for Strategic Air Command with a one-star general on board at all times, was in the air continuously from 1961 until 1990. Until 1990, that airborne strategic command post for SAC was airborne. And uh, late in the Eisenhower administration, President Eisenhower extended pre-delegated authorities to interceptor fighter planes that had nuclear-equipped air-to-air missiles, the Genie anti-air missile system, so that pilots flying above the Arctic Circle could shoot tactical nukes without getting any kind of clearance from a higher level commander. But what if a decapitation strike was actually to succeed? At the very end of his second term as the President of the United States, Eisenhower issued pre-delegated authorities to the nuclear armed commanders in chief. Rumsfeld insisted that we stop calling these guys commanders in chief. There's only one commander in chief, that's the president. We used to call like the commander of SAC or the commander of US European Command. We call them SINCs, commanders in chief. Now we just call them component commanders. But nevertheless, many of these component commanders had fielded nuclear forces, and Eisenhower gave them written permission to fire nuclear weapons without his say so under certain conditions. Essentially, if a, some kind of decapitation attack had succeeded, knocked out the president, knocked out the constitutional chain of command, or so disrupted the command and control system that this it wasn't possible to, to get positive guidance from Washington to use those weapons. So he issued these instructions. So this provides kind of the historical back study here for the, the you know, plan R in Dr. Strangelove. It's not exactly that, but neither is that a wholly fictitious, absurd kind of figment of Kubrick's imagination. There were actually scenarios in which not, not the crew of an individual bomber, but responsible parties at, at, at very senior levels had the authorization to order nuclear attacks. What's interesting is that the Eisenhower administration never told the incoming Kennedy administration that these pre-delegations had been issued. Uh, they were discovered by accident by a trusted public servant, a, a dedicated defense professional working inside the Pentagon uh, by the name of Daniel Ellsberg. So uh, Daniel Ellsberg, this is before he leaked the Pentagon Papers and before he decided that, that you know, he, he didn't really like what he was party to, was out doing a, a fact-finding mission in U.S. Pacific Command, and guys just sort of casually mentioned him. Yeah, we've got these pre-delegated orders. In the event of a, of, of a war, we don't need word from Washington to use them. goes back to the White House and tells McGeorge Bundy this, and, and they start digging around and discover oh my God, this is true. The, the, the nuclear six do have these advanced orders. Kennedy did not want to explicitly revoke them because he was always concerned uh, about the appearance of some middling Navy, you know, junior naval officer from World War II, overruling what apparently was the, the prudence of the best judgment of a five-star general lifelong military servant, West Point graduate. So he kind of wishful thinking, just thought that all the nuclear sinks would assume that those pre-delegations expired when the guy who signed them was no longer the president. Mm -hmm. But all the nuclear sinks, on the other hand, assumed that these remain valid until somebody actively revokes them. And no one ever did actively revoke them under the Kennedy Johnson administration. In fact, it's it, Matter of public record now, the Johnson administration revised and updated these a little bit. And then the unclassified paper trail kind of peters out. We come up to the present day and things, there's a rolling wall of classification. And, you know, any kind of changes after the Johnson administration remain in that shadow of rolling classification. But Daniel Ellsberg, in his most recent book on the subject, assumes that those pre delegations still exist, but, but that is an assumption by Daniel Ellsberg, not on the basis of, of any positive evidence. 
Daniel Ellsberg in that book, by the way, admits that when he stole all of the Pentagon Papers, he was also stealing all kinds of nuclear secrets. But he buried them in his brother-in-law's backyard in New York, and a torrential rainstorm washed them all away. And there, there's like somewhere they're buried along the coast of the Hudson River. And he never did get to publish an expose based upon those secrets that he pilfered. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he had to wait to write that book until so much of it came into public record that uh, he, he felt that there was enough corroborating evidence out there to support what it was that he was writing about. What's interesting then is in this context, there's a, a, a cliche, right, that got common usage and remains commonly said in this context. Only the president, only the president can order the use of nuclear weapons. Everyone knows that only the president can order the use of nuclear weapons. And it turns out that we know, as a matter of declassified historical fact, that that was not true, historically at least, not, not during this chapter of the Cold War. That was not true. It was, however, offered to reassure an American people who, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis, were worried about the prospect of a Curtis LeMay gone mad, or even worse, I told you to take a you Jack D. Ripper. Ripper. There's nothing anybody can do about this thing now. I'm the only person who knows that we let it go. And I don't insist that you give it to me. I take it out of the book, and my father wants to have it done. Hendrick, I suppose it never occurred to you. While we're chatting here, so enjoy a plane. Decision is being made by the president and the joint chiefs in the war room at the Pentagon. When they realize there's no possibility of recalling the wing, there's only one course of action only. We'll come back. Henry, you don't recall what Tom and Sean said about war? Yeah, I do I do He said war was too important to be left in general. When he said that, 50 years ago, might have been right. But today, war is too important to be left to politicians. They have neither the time the training or the inclination for strategic thought. I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion, and the international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. <laughs> so, Jack D. Ripper there cites Clemenceau, what's not cited but is oftentimes inferred by so much of the dialogue and so much of the mise en scene in this movie, uh, is another great, great mind of an earlier era, Sigmund Freud. And in fact, some analysts have made a lot of hay about this movie and all of the sexual metaphors that are in it. Uh, the question, though, that I find interesting here, uh, returning to this point about this reassurance that only the president is authorized to use atomic weapons, uh, has to do with whether or not that is, in fact, a reassurance to the American people today. That, that was the intent, right, when that was sort of part of, of the you know, public propaganda campaign of the Defense Department in the 50s and, and in the 60s was to you know, settle down the fears of a, of a, of a Jack D. E. Ripper or Curtis LeMay gone, gone wild. And in point of fact, when the 25th Amendment raced through Congress, it took longer for the states to ratify, but it moved through Congress relatively swiftly following the assassination of John F. Kennedy. It was because at that moment, 
lawmakers, those responsible for the security of the United States, remain very, very afraid about what the Soviets could do to us, even as public fears had begun to drift more toward what might we do to ourselves. And there was a palpable fear in all of the debate behind the 25th Amendment, which, which restructured the succession to the presidency and made sure that there would never be a case in which there is not a vice president, right? Because before the nuclear age, many times there had been a you know, president sign office, vice presidents move up, and there's just a vacant vice presidency afterward. And it didn't matter. After Kennedy's assassination, and with this fear of a decapitation attack, that was intolerable, right? And, and, and the language about it was all about how do we make sure that there is always a finger on the nuclear trigger in the world we live in, a, a, a constitutionally legitimate finger needs to be on that trigger at all times. So when the Soviets try to spring that sneak attack, bam, almost unthinkingly, a constitutionally legitimate president, even if it is the Secretary of Agriculture, right, by the succession, that's better than allowing them to get an unreturned shot in. Turning the other cheek is never part of the conversation when it comes to strategizing or theorizing about nuclear war. Tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m., I will be on Wisconsin Public Radio's drive program Central Time talking about the Senate's recent vote to repeal the authorization for the use of military force in Iraq that dates to 2022, and I'll talk about war powers resolution and Congress's prerogative since 1973 to try to reassert its constitutional authority to call the shots on when and with whom the United States actually goes to war. What's interesting in that whole conversation, though, is there's been no real serious attempt to revisit, revise, or rethink the presidential prerogative of repelling sudden attack when it comes at the utmost scale of thermonuclear warfare. In that regard, the system constructed during the Cold War to prevent and to respond immediately to an attempted decapitation attack remains in place almost as though it was designed in the era of Dr. Strangelove. That's my happy note with which I will end my prepared remarks. And now I'll be happy to take any questions that anyone has. Thank you. About the movie or about you know, like anything really. So I noticed in the film that there were a lot of shots of uh, American military equipment. Were those shots given to Kubrick or no? He... No, in point of fact, uh, yeah, that's a really interesting. It's a, a great observation, and they had a master set builder. And they were able to piece all of that together with publicly available photographs. It's the first time that the Defense Department saw this. Um, you know, they thought somebody had, had leaked things. Like, there's no way that they could recreate these things that realistically. But they they did. It was just all stuff that they were able to get from you know press releases by the manufacturer or you know other you know candid stills of crewmen and things like that. So. Um, a zero Defense Department uh, participation in this movie. Uh, the extent of Defense Department involvement was the insistence at the beginning of the movie that they roll that, you know, kind of script across the screen that says the you know Department of the Air Force and Department of Defense want to say that nothing in this movie is remotely realistic. This could never, ever happen. And all resemblance, uh, uh, you know, is utterly coincidental, you know, to persons, whether living or dead. And the fact that the last word of it is dead, right? And it <laughs> scrolls across the screen. The first time I watched that, I, I thought that was just more tongue-in-cheek stuff from Kubrick. That Kubrick put that up there because it, of course, that sounds like what the Air Force would say. But, uh, but it's so over the top. And it ends with the word dead and nobody there can be that tone deaf 
<laughs> but no, that that was exactly the, the the language that was insisted upon by the Pentagon uh, to screen the movie. And you know they didn't want to fight lawsuits or anything like that. But it it actually benefits the film, uh, I, I think, to have that disclaimer at the beginning. Uh, yeah. So no participation from DOD whatsoever. Any other questions? Do you have any thoughts as to why Dr. Strangelove over time is still much revered, where the other movie obviously pales, so people don't never even heard of it, many so I'm just your opinion. Yeah, I, so everything about Strange Love is arguably perfect. In the course I'm teaching right now on the introductory lesson, day one, I say very explicitly, I am not a film historian and I'm certainly not a scholar of film studies. I'm a military historian and the questions that animate this course are those of a scholar of war and society and, and, and military history. We're using movies to get at, at those questions. I'm saying the same disclaimer because I'm not qualified to critique the movie as a work of art, but to my layperson's eyes and mind, it's perfect. It's technically perfect. It's shot perfectly. The script is pitch perfect, and it has a lot to do with the actors uh, uh, themselves. And the fact that they get triple duty out of uh, Peter Sellers, of course, benefits the, the the movie. He was originally supposed to play Major Kong as well. And there's some kind of story. I think it's sort of debated. There, there, there are stills of him on set in a flight suit, getting into a mock-up of a pilot's chair. And the story is he sprained his ankle and couldn't do that. But there's also kind of a, a download story that he went to Kubrick and said, you're killing me. I cannot possibly do a fourth character. And this is one of the rare instances in which we can, you know, thank you know the fates or whatever that he didn't play the fourth character because slim pickens is incomparable as as major kong uh one other bit of trivia on slim pickens as major kong uh which you know people uh know but if you look closely while he's you know opening and inventorying his survival and, and evasion kit which has a lot of you know things that you wouldn't think that they would need when shot down in the arctic above the arctic circle is a, you know, geez, a fellow could have a real good time in Vegas with this. Um, if you read his lips closely, uh, he, when they, they filmed it, he said a fellow could have a real good time in Dallas with this. Mm -hmm. The movie was released in January of 64. And so they had to post-production voiceover Dallas uh, uh, to avoid any connection to the Kennedy assassination. Any other questions? Yes, you know. Well, I don't know if I should get into this in these hallowed halls, but uh, weren't you a little nervous when our former president was in office? Well, this is, uh, I, I was kind of tap dancing around that, you know, with, with the question, right, about whether or not Americans today derive any comfort from the idea that only the president is authorized to order the use of nuclear weapons. Um, you know, there was, a, of course, the famous case in the final days of the Nixon administration where Nixon was reportedly in his cups and losing his mind. Watergate was closing in around him. And Kissinger was, by all accounts, the de facto acting president of the United States um, that uh, Defense Secretary Schlesinger told the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, you get any orders from the, the, the president, you check with me before you execute those orders. And scholars and, and insiders have written about that back and forth and back and forth. And, and I've looked at, at, at all that that work and all of the literature. And he he later said, no, nothing of the sorts uh, really ever happened. I, I'm convinced that it, that it did. I, I, I think that, that that did, in fact, happen. And, uh, you know, that is, but by the way, I mean, the constitutional chain of command is from the president to the Secretary of Defense. And so it's not necessarily a subversion of the chain of command for this, you know, for the, the, the Secretary of Defense to, to, to want to be part of, of that, that line. But that, that was probably the first time in American history that the American people had reason to fear, or, or at least some Americans in the know had reason to fear the president's authority, which is almost absolute, 
um, predicated on this idea, this implicit idea in the Constitution that the president, that the Congress has the ability to declare war and authorize, you know, military operations, but the president has an obligation to repel sudden invasions. Um, what constitutes a sudden invasion uh, in an era of intercontinental ballistic missiles is not a question that I think is, I mean, it's a question scholars have talked about a lot, but, but thank goodness we haven't had to confront it uh, in, a, in a practical sort of way. And I think that that question has become even more problematic with the militarization of space and cyberspace as well. So a sudden, and, and, and what is a proportional response to that? And what we always kind of understood is if missiles are incoming, that you should respond. Right, and, and that's kind of the way that whole system is constructed with this, this you know, overwhelming preoccupation with having a constitutionally legitimate successor in the position to make that decision. But this could be somebody in some kind of, uh, you know, bunker out in Nebraska that, that, you know, a handful of people know about with two former SEP deaths from the last 50 years in the bunker with him, telling him or her what to do. And it could be the Secretary of Agriculture. And you know, if if the if the, the two former SEC deaths are telling the Secretary of Agriculture, Madam President, you you need to you need to respond now uh, or or we will lose the ability to respond. Um, Madam President's probably going to give the order to 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 respond, and so the, again, that that system of tripwires is gradually dismantled in large measure as the Cold War cooled and as the Soviet Union collapsed. But but elements of the of the system that are designed to respond to decapitation attack remain, you know, as I said, pretty much a strange load vintage. And and scholars did start, uh, and and people who who care about these people, which should be everybody, right? Started saying exactly that under the last administration, where it's time we revisit presidential authority to almost unilaterally uh, begin a potential nuclear war. We have a question in the chat. Um, has there been any real public film or news media discussion about the use of tactical nuclear weapons versus intercontinental use of nuclear weapons? That's a good question. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Patrick, can you think of one? Yeah. So, uh, and it, it's kind of amazing too, because you know the the whole defense policy of flexible response that the uh, Kennedy administration, the Johnson administration, brought in uh, with them, extended to nuclear deterrence, uh, and even before that, the new look uh, uh, doctrine of the Eisenhower administration, all of it depended upon tactical nuclear weapons for the defense of Western Europe, right? It's all of the war plans to defeat a Soviet invasion of Western Europe assumed the use of tactical artillery shells, short range and mid range ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads. Uh, and, and those those warheads were distributed to, to the forces. I mean, they, they were not under, uh, Certainly, this was not the Truman era, complete segregation of the military from the weapons they would use. I mean, Truman created the Atomic Energy Commission and, and made sure that those, you know, the weapons weren't even under military control until he said so. But the doctrines of the two, the three succeeding administrations all depended upon fielded tactical, tactical nuclear weapons. And so uh, the fact that I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but but um, two of us who kind of work around the subject aren't or aren't aware of it uh, is kind of interesting. Are there any other questions? That's it online too. Yeah, that's all I have online. Okay, were, were they online able to uh, get Leslie? But were they online able to hear the movie clips that I was playing? Just out of curiosity, they were a bit quiet. Okay. This is more of a comment than a question, but I was reading about this before I came uh, about the movie, and we just saw George, um, George C. Scott go crazy um, in that clip, and I've just read that um, Kubrick told him to go crazy and just play it out, and then they would do the real 
more sober version as the real cut later, and then actually use the crazy version. And George C. Scott got so upset, he would never work with Kubrick again. I've not encountered that particular okay. vignette. The, I, I have noticed in my homework on the movie for teaching it, though, there are there are competing commentaries, right? So this is one of the neat things about a movie that remains a classic like this, that's you know, like, you know, still still being viewed, still being produced. Crit the Criterion Collection has pulled this into its canon and you get all those special features. And so the special features accumulate as, you know, you, you pass anniversaries and they interview more and more people. And sometimes the commentaries conflict with one another. So uh, for instance, uh, there was for a long time a story that, that Peter Sellers uh, improvised a great, great many of his lines. And part of the brilliance of the movie was the improvisation of, of Peter Sellers. And there's a later commentary by, by you know, an associate director or something like that. It said, that's that's actually a, a, a myth. That wasn't true. If you, if you look at the original script and then watch what Peter Sellers says, nearly every line is faithful to the script that the three screenwriters wrote. Uh, the kernel of truth to that would be kind of along the lines of what you're saying, they would do different takes with different tones and different meter, different delivery. It was the same line. I mean, the improvisation would be in the way that you deliver the line and Kubrick would pick the version that, that he wanted. George C. Scott was, um, I don't want to say infamously surly, but he was, he was, he was a Hollywood outsider and was, did not like the Hollywood scene, did not like Hollywood people, uh, didn't accept his uh, best actor Oscar for Patton, uh, didn't, didn't show up, didn't, didn't want it because of his contempt for the whole thing. So for, for um, you know, uh, an actor of that disposition to be displeased with his director sounds mildly plausible to me. <laughs> I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so today's undergraduates were born circa 2002, 2003. Um, and their great sort of existential worries, climate change. Yeah. Uh, the fact that there are nuclear weapons out there capable of causing a great deal of destruction registers as a second, third, or fourth level concern for most people of that age. How do your students respond to this film? in class, uh, in what ways does it speak to them? In what ways does it um, seem we're very foreign to their experience? Yeah, so uh, before you came in, I mentioned it, my, my intro. This is one of the movies that resonates very well with the undergraduates and many of them have seen it before I, I assign it to them as homework as well. And I chalk that up just to their appreciation of, of satire. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the satire is a is a language that they, they speak and understand and they can appreciate the comedy on its own terms. Uh, and I, I have to be very explicit with them is you, you have to understand that at the moment that this movie was made, um, this was, the, you know, the whole how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb was was tongue in cheek. And it was the, the intent was the exact opposite. Uh, it's time to wake up and really worry about the bomb. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I don't think that that's the way in which they perceive it. And you're right when it comes to climate change. It's another interesting thing is you know, my own youth, uh, you know, remembering Three Mile Island and things like that. N nuclear, nuclear energy was a great bugabear of the environmental movement. And now uh, it's, it's back, you know, in the graces of being a potentially green solution uh, to, to, to climate issues. And so... Um, I, my my guess is uh, I have to be explicit, you know, with, with them to 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 place it in that context of, of fear because it's just, otherwise it's just really good comedy. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, we're you know we're we're at about an hour on the dot so i think that's earlier than we had scheduled but i, I feel like I've, I've earned my pay which is nothing so, uh, all right well thank you all for coming and thanks for those who tuned in online
Uh, I apologize for those who couldn't uh, uh, see the clips that I, sh I showed. And so what we uh, might be able to arrange if people who are online want to be able to see some of the clips that, that I can uh, put a recording of, of, of this. We can, we can post a recording of this so you can probably hear the audio a little bit better. But thanks for those who are on Zoom. Thank you all for coming in person as well. But thanks, Patrick, for the invitation. Uh, thank you, John, for, for coming. Before you all leave, just want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Patrick Iver. I teach mostly Latin American history here in the department. I'm serving as the associate chair of the department for the time, or a time. We'll see how long that time is. But um, uh, among my responsibilities is the history club. So I would love to hear from you about the kind of programming that you would like that we can set up for the fall or next spring, the kind of ideas for this. I mean, I'm really grateful to John for doing this and teaching this more in film class. It seemed like a perfect opportunity to have this kind of discussion for you. So if we want to keep doing film screenings and film discussions, we can do those. Uh, if you have other thoughts and ideas, I'm very open to hearing uh, from you. So um, just please feel free to reach out and uh, I look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you.